former president, including whether she thinks he'll make a bid for the White House in 2024. She also comments on the likelihood of him testifying before the January 6th committee. This meeting with reporters is hosted by the Christian Science Monitor. Of course. All right. Good morning. I'm Linda Feldman, Washington Bureau Chief of the Christian Science Monitor. Our guest today is Kellyanne Conway, former senior counselor to President Donald Trump. This is her third appearance at a Monitor Breakfast, so welcome. Um, first, a little bit of background. Ms. Conway is a native of Atco, New Jersey, and has degrees from uh, Trinity College, now Trinity Washington University, here in D.C., and from the George Washington University Law School. But she found her calling as a pollster and uh, over the years has advised many Republican candidates um, and finally, of course, advised um, Donald Trump and in 2016 made history as Mr. Trump's campaign manager, uh, becoming the first woman to manage a successful American presidential campaign. Ms. Conway served as senior counselor to President Trump from his inauguration until August of 2020, but I'm gonna guess that her two favorite titles are mom and maybe champion blueberry packer. Oh, yeah, for sure. But you yeah. didn't put that in your book. <laughs> oh. So I noticed um, from her days as packing blueberries as a teenager in South Jersey. Also have to ask, are you a Phillies fan? I'm a, I'm a Philly fan. I'm really an Eagles fan. Eagles, oh, Yankees. Eagles. Well, they're both bi bi bipartisan both, as I get. They're both yes, doing but we're excited for the Phillies. So, all right. Now for the ground rules. We made the wrong kind of history last night. The Phillies. That was yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. Uh, we're on the record here. Please, no live blogging or tweeting. In short, no filing of any kind while the breakfast is underway. Um, there's no embargo when the session ends at 10, and we will email pictures and a rough transcript from this breakfast to all the reporters here as soon as, as, soon as we finish. Um, as you know, if you'd like to ask a question, please send me a signal, and I will call on as many of you as time permits. And now, um, Ms. Conway, if you'd like to make brief opening remarks, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, each and every one of you, for being here and for your questions. Please proceed with your breakfast. I was raised by four Italian women. We believe in eating at all times, so uh, enjoy manja, enjoy your breakfast. <clears throat> so I look at the 2022 midterms, and I see what is perhaps the most straightforward, least complicated issue set I've ever seen in the 34 years of doing this. I think voters have been pretty straightforward for over a year now as to what at a broad level is motivating them what keeps them up at night if you will as we would ask in focus groups and this will not strike you as brand new information breaking news it's rising costs it's rising crime it's a little bit of uh, continued concern over education parents don't say i'm a demographic cohort to be managed or pursued i'm not an interest group to be studied i'm, pa I'm a parent and they're still incredibly concerned over the after effects, the, the longer hangover, the letdown over the lockdowns, the, the reduced test scores, the emotional and mental challenges that Gen Z is telling pollsters, admitting to pollsters, are very much front and center for them. <clears throat> and so that I think that with parents, um, and even non-parents, frankly, there is, it's given education maybe a sustained outsized level of importance in midterms, even at the federal level, where folks are saying, well, you gave the COVID money for the schools or you were in charge of, um, you, you had a lot to say with shutting down the schools, et cetera. But they don't want it to end with, thank God, which has been the end of the most serious part of COVID. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, of course, after the Dobbs decision, abortion became more important on the ballot. I think there's um, outsized coverage of how important it is to pro-choice Americans. It's also very important to pro-life Americans. And many of them will show up to vote this time because of that decision as well. We all know, uh, CNN admitted it a few weeks ago, that abortion is, quote, faded was their term, so I'll adopt it. Uh, faded from intense importance. You see that it's really diminished in the polls in terms of a top three, top five issue. If you're asking people what are the most important issues, if you're asking them how much each of the following issue is extremely or very important to you, it does rise up a bit. 
And I believe a lot of the votes that have already been banked in early voting do include an awful lot of pro-choice voters. Um, they were motivated in 2022 to come out and vote early, much the way they were motivated in 2020 to come out early and vote against the president in power. So many of those votes have been banked. I believe those people did show up um, by and large. But as I wrote in an op-ed just this week for foxnews.com, women are not single-issue thinkers, so we are not single-issue voters. We are multi-thinkers. We are multitaskers. Therefore, we are multidimensional voters, putting an awful lot of issues, individuals, ideas, and impressions into our big voter cauldron, staring it up and making a choice. And this year, uh, women and some other groups like Hispanics are trending more Republican. It's for any number of reasons, but the shift in the Wall Street Journal poll as released just this week, since August of 2022, a double-digit shift, 20-some points among suburban women who are 20% of the electorate as the journal reports, um, has been pretty dramatic. You really don't see shifts in voters, but particularly female voters, that dramatic that quickly. You'd have to go back and see um, so, some pretty important events and inflection points for that to be the case. And it does also tell me something that's completely confounding to me, that the Democrats allowed, them, allowed this to continue and fester and do what I would say is the most minor course correction and having the bully pulp and having the first female vice president of the United States and having some surrogates out there like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. I think they should have done what they're doing now in November, in September and August. And they, they, they didn't do that. And they are trying to tell America what's important to America. Americans have a way of telling us what's important to them. So trying to make this election about January 6th, about Trump, 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 about just abortion, about climate change hasn't worked because this time Americans are very, very straightforward about what's important to them. And one of my last points, I think the Republicans, um, curiously and remarkably, surprisingly, have had incredible message discipline. That's not always the case. And they have also done a fantastic job of recruiting candidates that look more like America. And so the elector is not just changing for the Republican Party, Linda and colleagues. The the number of candidates who are running and winning as Republicans is also changing. So we have 81 women running for office this time. We had a record number in 2020. We busted through that number again. We have a record number of candidates of color, of veterans, of people of very diverse backgrounds who come to the table as the Republican nominees at every level and, and talk about those diverse backgrounds, talk about why they're Republicans. Oh, you don't look like a Republican, whatever that means itself a little bit of an insult, but they, then they explain why. They are not just voting Republican, but running as Republican. And I think the fact that the NRCC and these committees just this last week announced new six-figure investments <coughs> in congressional districts that Joe Biden carried by double digits two short years ago is part and parcel of that, meaning these candidates who are running, they're already there. They're not just placeholders. Not like, oh, I'll take one for the team and make sure we have a, a Republican nominee. They've been waiting for their breakout movement. They've been waiting for a, a, a Republican trending year and the resources to be there to give them that little extra oomph. And in some of those races, frankly, it's not, it hasn't gone from uh, lean D to lean R. It's, it's migrating over to toss up or from solid D to, to lean D. And in the good Republican year, those are the kind that can be swept in um, last minute. But I'm really... I, I've campaigned with many of these candidates. I've met most of them. I'm really most impressed by how our bench is being built and filled by incredibly um, vibrant and articulate and committed, enthusiastic, ready to go, ready to run candidates who are half my age. Some of them are very young. As I say, many of them have diverse backgrounds. They all have diverse backgrounds, but they also represent um, the growing diversity of the Republican Party. And then I can't, I think you can't just, you can't dismiss what's happened with the Hispanic vote in a short amount of time. Donald Trump got it started. He did much better among Hispanics and African Americans and Asian Americans in 2020 over 2016. But that's just grown as more and more um, Latina and Latinos particularly are saying, excuse me, these are the important issues. I'm worried about inflation and the economy. I'm worried about education. I'm worried about crime. And it turns out immigration has been a boon for the Republican Party. I saw Steve Kordaki at his board the other day, plus 33 for the Republicans on immigration. Who would have thought that? No one in this room, except maybe me and Alex, because we were told that Donald Trump's 
emphasis on immigration was going to hurt the Republican Party. People should have reread the autopsy from 10 years ago, which was complete nonsense. And uh, now Republicans have this 33 point advantage, according to Steve Kornacki at the board the other day, on the issue of immigration. Pretty remarkable. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, I'll start with a few and then we'll move to others around the room. Um, so I have to ask you, is democracy on the ballot, as the president said? Well, democracy is always on the ballot because uh, one vote, one person is enshrined in our Constitution. And it's, I think it's one of the most equalizing factors for people who otherwise feel like they don't have a voice or a choice in many ways in this country anymore. Um, that's why I'm against certain things like uh, electability being carrying the conversation and I'm critical of been critical of the Republican Party for years talking about electability electability is a fiction because it pretends I know if you will or won't win long before election day mm -hmm. and it robs people of their choices and their voices um, let the people decide don't suppress the vote don't discourage the vote mm -hmm. by telling people we don't need your vote your candidates way ahead or your candidates way behind don't even bother um, secondly, democracy on the democracy does not belong to one party. It belongs to all. It is the promise to each of us. We are a constitutional republic. Our democracy belongs to each and every one of us equally. So the fact that the Democratic Party, and frankly, some of you enabling them respectfully, believe that they own this idea of democracy, protecting democracy, is foolish. Are you concerned, though, about uh, unrest, violence, about uh, or about people? maybe even just not voting at all, either because they're worried about some kind of crazy things happening or uh, that they maybe say Republicans thinking, oh, we've got this, I don't need to vote. Well, I, I worry, yes, you talked about that outdoor. I worry every day that people think their vote doesn't count that, or that it won't be counted or that it doesn't matter or that it's, um, it'll be canceled or it won't be considered or, to my earlier point, that their party so far ahead or so far behind that why bother at all. I also worry that they think things in, in Washington where Congress has earned a low approval rating are so corrosive, are, are so non-collaborative that they don't want to be complicit in that by actually voting, by participating. That would be the wrong message. Um, but I can't believe that the country has been saying, Linda, for months now, I'm worried about crime and violence, van random violence. I'm worried about the occupational hazard of taking the subway to work in New York City. I'm worried about people in the street just being stabbed or beaten or worse. And the response to I'm concerned about crime and violence from many of the Democrats and this White House has been January 6th. Well, my goodness, that was a horrible day. I put out my statement. You can read it. You may not have ever or forgotten about it because it was uh, a searing indictment of everything that happened that day and the people responsible for it. Um, and that'll never change. I feel about January 6th the way I feel about Paul Pelosi's attacker, the way I feel about random violence, the way I feel about people looting and burning down their cities in 2020. I feel crime and criminals should be arrested, indicted, prosecuted, punished, know their fate mm -hmm. in, in, our, in our great um, rule of law based country. But the idea that people are waking up every day and seeing January 6, 2021 on the calendar is just wrong. And there are a couple of smart Democrats who have said that recently, and they're right. Um, that was a terrible day. It will always be a terrible day. There were, as I see, 10,000 people on the Capitol grounds, which of course you don't, need a, you don't need a permit to do, but those who breached the Capitol and those, I believe, were up to 75 who were prosecuted, I, I saw recently. Let's call it 74, 75 who were prosecuted for crimes, um, and the, let's talk about the 75 million Trump-Pence voters who weren't at the Capitol and aren't going to be prosecuted mm. for crimes on January 6th. Okay, one more. How often do you speak with Donald Trump? Often. How often is often? But I'm also a unicorn. I speak with Mike Pence, too. You mean they don't speak, do speak to each in other? Equal, in equal measure? Or do you um, well, I won't reveal that. I just will tell you that I, I feel close to each of them and have for a very long time. I was Mike, po Mike Pence's pollster before he was um, tapped to be the vice presidential nominee and of mm -hmm. course the president. I think they made, um, they did fabulous things for this country together for four years. Mm -hmm. It was a nasty divorce in the end, but they need to find a responsible way to co-parent uh, the future of the party and the conservative movement. Mm -hmm. And I certainly hope that they'll um, come together. It's funny, I never hear from either Trump or Pence an insult about the other. Um, if anything, it comes from, as Donald Trump might say, quote, their people. 
uh, and <laughs> and that's uh, that's too bad. And I think people have all types of motivations to keep that schism in place. But I like to focus on all the great things they did for this country because, frankly, whoever runs for president as a Republican in the future, and whoever is the next uh, Republican president in two short years, uh, that person should really look at the Trump Pence accomplishments, especially mm -hmm. early on, as a model for governance. Okay, one more for me. Can you shed any light? on what Donald Trump would do with another term in office. Yes, why, I, why does he want to be president? Yes, I can. I think Donald Trump wants to run again for any number of reasons. First of all, he is as sad and disappointed and frustrated as apparently a majority of the country, mm -hmm. Linda, according to all the polls, as what's happened to this country in such a short time. We are not energy independent. We don't have a humming economy. We don't have less than 2% inflation. It's 8.1. We don't have uh, border security. Look at the polls of Americans. Look at the polls of Hispanics in this country who don't believe the border is secure, who believe immigration is is a top issue that this administration has failed on. We have Putin in Ukraine. We, we don't have our best friend in the region, Israel, feeling secure vis-a-vis -a, -vis a nuclear capable Iran salivating across the way. We don't have trade deals that are being enforced and that are that are are being executed upon. Um, <clears throat> we don't have satisfaction among job creators, job seekers, and job holders. And we certainly don't have, we, we have an increase in crime. Um, people feel less secure financially, physically, less secure um, for, at the border, less secure around the globe. And they feel like everyday life is increasingly unaffordable. So Donald Trump feels, I did it the first time, I can do it again. And if he runs a binary choice election, he certainly can prevail. If he just reminds you of life under President Trump and life under President Biden and sticks to those binary mm. contrasts on the record, he's got a good story to tell. Number two, the reason he wants to run is he thought he would still be there in the entire second term agenda um, structured. And a lot of that is still being run through America First Policy Institute, AFPI, which is the think tank that is sort of not just preserving his the policy legacies of the White House administration, but also how do we move it forward for the next administration. And number three, Donald Trump agrees with a majority of Democrats that we cannot have Joe Biden again in 2024. Okay, uh, Jonathan Salant from your home state of New Jersey. First of all, uh you know, North Jersey is supposed to support the Giants and the Yankees. <laughs> South Jersey supports the Phillies and the Eagles. But Jersey is a perfect example of a state that, at the 2020, they, they redistributed. They made, basically made nine safe Democratic seats, including the one where you are. Uh, they, you know, they reelected a Democratic governor for the first time in since 1978 when I started in journalism, and yet uh, they're all running scared now that there's at least two competitive races. The other two, uh, Mike and Cheryl spent like $2 million in the last three weeks. They're all running scared. Jersey's not supposed to be immune from this red wave, and it's not. Why, why isn't it? Yeah, great questions. So let me just say also that Glenn Youngkin prevailed against Terry McAuliffe a year ago, but Jack Chitterelli came close. And there's a great article. It's either, maybe you wrote it, but it's somewhere in the New Jersey press that shows there were 131,000 votes in two counties in New Jersey in, I believe, Ocean and Morris, where there were votes, 131,000 New Jerseyans who voted for Donald Trump in 2020 who didn't vote at all in 2021, mm -hmm. to our earlier point. And I think Jack Cittarelli left those ballots, well, I know he left those people at home, by not just tapping into Trump's relationship with those voters the way Youngkin did. Youngkin accepted Donald Trump's endorsement. He had him do Teletown Hall the night before to get those voters out. They were in touch. I have read the thank you, the handwritten thank you letter that Glenn Youngkin sent to Donald Trump. So uh, that's the way I think people have to em embrace the Trump voters by having the person they trust, Donald Trump, to say, this is my guy or this is my gal. They're, they, you want them to be your next governor, your next United States senator. Mm -hmm. But he came awfully close. Um, the redistricting is a problem everywhere. And the reason you're not going to see another 63 seat gain by other party, the way um, President Obama famously said was his shellacking in 2010, is because of redistricting, in my view. It's because we have so few truly competitive seats now. And, uh, you know, again, maybe that's a quote threat to democracy in some way, Linda, that we don't have truly competitive seats. In New Jersey, though, I think people really have had enough of those lockdowns, the education. I have um, two children in, in high school in New Jersey, I have two children in school here. 
and so I know firsthand uh, the effects, the net effects on these kids and a lot of their friends and talk to other parents all the time and that's the best focus group I can lend to you. Um, also, New Jersey is just a state where people are done saying, you know, we pay higher taxes, but but what? Uh, look how many people have moved to North Carolina, to Florida, to other states, um, to, to Texas, certainly to Tennessee, from high tax states. And I think um, the, the best thing I can tell you about Tom Malinowski, who is on the precipice of perhaps losing to Tom Kane, and Mikey Sherrill, who won in 2018, which was a great year for Democrats in, in that seat in Morris County, is they haven't distinguished themselves. And if all you're running on again, if your answer to everything is January 6th, Trump, 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 abortion, you're not responding to what New Jerseyans are telling you is animating them and keeping them up at night, which they've been very clear what that is. And I think Phil Murphy came close to losing, but some of these folks are going to lose because the frustrations they felt a year ago have not been mitigated or modified by those same people in power. Last point. The most important polling issue to me right now, the most important polling number on a significant issue to me in the last year has been the migration of voters toward the Republican Party everywhere on the issue of education. Mm -hmm. So this was an issue that for decades the Democrats, they dominated by 18 points, 20 points, sometimes 22 points on the question of which party do you trust more on the issue of education. Democrats had this outsized double digit advantage nationwide and in states like New Jersey. And that has dissipated. On a good day, the Democrats are plus six. On a great day for my party, it's tied, as some of these polls have shown. And that is a direct result of the last couple of years. It's also, may I say, a Jersey girl who met Cory Booker for the first time 20 some years ago mm -hmm. at a school choice and charter school conference. I was introduced to him by a gentleman, big charter school, school choice advocate and donor in Tampa, the Tampa area in Florida, um, for whom Cory Booker ended up being a groomsman in his wedding, if I'm not mistaken. I met Cory Booker at a school choice charter school conference. Is that the last day he ever went to one? I mean, you had great Democrats for years saying, I'm for school choice, I'm for charters, I'm for educational freedom, I'm for opportunity scholarships. Where are they? Find me one in the federal government. In, 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 in up on Capitol Hill. Where are you in 60 years, ladies and gentlemen, after bigoted Democratic governors in the South in this country stood in the schoolhouse door, refusing to let kids of color inside the schools? We have bigoted Democrats all across this country standing in that schoolhouse door, not allowing kids of every background to leave these failing schools and access a quality, affordable education worthy of their humanity and dignity. How in the world did that issue become controversial, let alone partisan. There's one party fighting for those kids to have those opportunity scholarships and educational freedom and school choice and charters. I did a press conference years ago um, on Capitol Hill with Floyd Flake. He was a congressman at the time, black pastor from you know New York, and Joe Lieberman, who, ended up, who went on to be Al Gore's running mate. This was in the late 90s. How has this happened? And I'm telling you, the education issue, I won't call it a sleeper issue because it's right in front of our faces, but while people are talking about rising costs and rising crime, this is also there. It's very much there. And a state like New Jersey, where we have, these kids are suffering. They're absolutely suffering in a lot of these school districts in the inner cities where some of them didn't even show up for online schooling and, and certainly are, are way behind now. Who is looking out for them? I mean, it, it, it angers me most days. Some days I'm close to emotional about it. We owe, everybody around this table as Americans, we owe these school children a quality, dignity education that's worthy of them. Uh, Zach Wise from National Journal. Hi, thanks for the question. I am um, two things. Firstly, when will Trump announce his 2024 presidential bid? We'll start, I'll start with that. Is there a follow-up? There, there, so. there, yeah, there will be some question, but I don't understand. Well, around. he'd like to have done it already. And I give him credit for um, many things this, this year because he's going to end up being a big winner from this election cycle. Try as everybody's did to say, you nominated the wrong people, you didn't give enough money, you're in the way, go away. Uh, you know, Donald Trump in some ways never stopped campaigning from early 2015, first for himself, 
and in between for many, many different candidates. I mean, unlike Joe Biden, Trump was highly in demand in 2018 and did what he could to show up for many of these races, could only go for a couple of the House seats, but went around for a lot of the Senate seats. And we picked up seats in the Senate after the Kavanaugh hearings. Again, something totally misread, respectfully. We picked up seats in the United States Senate in 2018. Hard to do, lost, I think, 40 seats or so in the House. So he never stopped campaigning, including into his post-presidency years. And I would say it's hard for me to see that Joe Biden ever started really campaigning. Uh, did he ever start campaigning for himself in 2019, 2020, after COVID hit? And he certainly isn't welcome in most places and spaces now. So in many ways, don't miss why and how Trump is, is running for president again, if he would like, because he actually never stopped being part of this. So he would have liked, I give him credit for staying in the game this cycle, with very few exceptions, and I can't even think of any right this second. I can think of the individual candidates, like Matt Dolan in Ohio, who lost, but I can't think of individual Republicans on the ballot who are not running mostly, if not almost completely, on the America First agenda and the Trump-Pence accomplishments. So his legacy continued. So that's one. I give him a ton of credit for not announcing this year, for not stepping in the way of the midterm candidates which a lot of people around him who frankly need him for their next meal and their next gig and their next center of power were urging him and begging him and leaking to a lot of you that he would be he would be announcing any moment i'm glad that he didn't do that that was certainly my advice from the beginning you know wait until after the midterms um if you do it all secondly i like the fact that he came back to washington at the end of july a full year and a half since leaving uh, on January 20th, 2021, and gave a policy speech. It took Donald, it took President Trump an hour and a minute, roughly, to get to the 2020 election in that policy speech at AFPI, which you all covered. And then he went on to CPAC and gave mostly a policy speech. So when he does that, when people hear the binary choice and they're reminded of why he, his words, you miss me, don't you? Um, they'll say, you know what? I'm gonna push aside whatever I don't like and I'm going to vote my pocketbook, my personal liberty, my, my fear of crime, my frustration with no baby formula on the shelves, rising costs of gas and groceries, which is a six month old conversation. The conversation now is utilities, insurance, rent, mortgage, tuition, student loan payment. So I think you can expect him to announce soon. Um, obviously there's a family wedding coming up on his property and uh, election day is late this year. But um, as he would say, wait and see. And then I, you know, and then he's got a lot to think about too, though, because the super PAC obviously can't be converted into a presidential um, source of funding. It, he's, he, I, I ask him all the time, I asked him this summer, what happens to your fund and your funding? He said, what do you mean on the funding piece? He was very conversant with what he can and cannot do. He'd obviously been um, deeply briefed on that. And he knows, he knows that already. Um, and then I ask about his fun, because I care about him, the person. He's got a great life. He's got a great post-presidency life. They're making money. Again, he's um, involved in the, you know, here's somebody unlike President George W. Bush or President Bill Clinton, President Barack Obama. They left the presidency after two terms as young men. And that was it. I think one of the worst things that could ever happen to those gentlemen is a cabinet secretary, former cabinet secretary, former senior staffer saying, oh, Mr. President, hello, I'm running for office. Will you help me? Oh, geez. You know, I've left all that behind. Donald Trump is just getting started. So he loves this stuff and wants to continue. So I think you should, you know, maybe keep your cell phone on. And sorry if you made any post-election plans since these races are never all called in time. There's always a runoff in Louisiana or Georgia, it seems these days, somehow. Um, but he would like to have announced by now and I think the fact that he hasn't uh, is uh, really a big credit to him and his restraint and him not wanting to, him wanting to help in these midterms and not step on them. He's being urged by some people to still have a surprise, a November surprise. But we're trying to mitigate November surprises for all the candidates and, and include mis uh, message discipline. Last point, if and when Donald Trump announces his presidential run, it doesn't scramble the Republican field, it scrambles the Democratic field. I think that's when the George Wills of the world really kick into high gear and say, what are we doing here? We're going to have a cage match rematch of these two. 
And I know Ron Klain, tweeter, not a leader, and others um, like to say, well, we're ready for Trump. We want to run against Trump again. Do they really? Because you've seen the polls, even if it, not just the rematch polls, the complete, unarguable, indisputable <laughs> lack of popularity and lack of approval of a sitting president, and frankly, many pieces of his agenda that they've not been able to sell in a way that makes people have confidence in their competence. That's just very clear. So do they really want to do that? I think the Democrats then have a hard time, and they would have liked to have. I always give advice to the Democrats. They would have liked to have been able to say, you know what, Joe Biden, step aside. You finally got the brass ring. You helped get rid of Donald Trump. Thank you very much. You've been running for president for decades. You did it. You go down this history. You did it. But please step aside and take credit for one more historic thing. We could just elevate and then elect your female vice president. No one can say that. 18 senior staffers have left her. If they don't want to work for her, if they don't want her to be vice president or president, what about the rest of us? They, can, they simply cannot say to him, your vice president, your hand-picked vice president is waiting in the wings and she's ready to do the job. She won't make it. They don't want her either. So I think it, t it, it scrambles the Democratic field almost immediately. Trump's influence over Kevin McCarthy, uh, uh, how does that change depending on the size of the House GOP majority? His influence? Well, they work together, they collaborate. I mean, the commitment to America that I think was a very wise document strategically and substantively for the Republicans to issue in uh, late September, around the same time that we did the contract with America, September 27th, Capital Steps 1994. I was a baby pollster then working on that. And I think that was very smart for them to put out. If you read it, very much tracks with what America First Policy Institute is doing. It very much tracks. And Brooke Rollins and I met with Kevin, Linda McMahon. We, let, we met with Kevin McCarthy and his team before that. Um, so I think it's not influence so much as collaboration. And I, Kevin McCarthy is going to not just have a squeaker of a majority the way Speaker Pelosi has now. He's going to have a governing majority. It's going to be a big enough majority to get things done fairly quickly. And that's going to be very different than the Washington we've seen right now, where you have just Democrats voting for things like the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, you're going to see a governing majority for Republicans and, I believe, Speaker McCarthy doing things very quickly to get us back in balance and to show America that Washington can work very quickly and very efficiently for them. But no, they're, they're close. And, um, and I, I, I personally think we're going to have a majority in the Senate as well. You don't think that, that having a larger majority will give McCarthy a bit more independence at the very least? But independent from what? From the right. Trump any, Pence agenda? Any from particular the... group that's with a small, a smaller group that's within his own party? Well, I will tell you, I think Kevin's done a fantastic job of making sure that everybody is heard. And there are one or two who still like to complain to get on TV and to get in your blind quotes. But other than them, I mean, I was there on the stage, Commitment to America. They rolled it out on a Friday. I was there the day before on the stage with Stefanik, Scalise, McCarthy, Newt, Gingrich, and me. The five of us on the stage, and I, mean, I felt very privileged, very honored to be there, and wanted to make good use of the time, how best to communicate this, what we see in the polls. But I will tell you that um, they all, then they had microphones available. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene spoke about how she thought this document was solid. Very happy to have it. Congressman Louis Gohmert spoke. Um, maybe some people wanted something in there that wasn't. Maybe some people didn't want something in there that doesn't. But 500 words, a, a double-sided palm card, it's not the binders. Uh, we have binders. Anyone needs binders, I have binders. You know, I was a pollster, then a lawyer, then a pollster. I have binders if you need them. But 500 words, and it was not just a bunch of pablum and sound bites. It's substantive things. It basically is an economy that is strong, a nation that is safe, a future that is free, a government that is accountable with substance there. So I think he's done a really good job also of showing up in different people's districts and making sure that people are respected and heard and resourced. Okay, so Others. we're running out of time, actually. Well, that's too so bad. Let's just stay. Let's have <laughs> uh, John Gizzi from Newsmax. And then I've got a bunch of others, so let's thank have you, like, lightning. Uh, thank you, Kellyanne, for coming this morning. Do you see a change in the zeitgeist in the Republican Party Coming, in other words, becoming more of an America first party with Cheney and Kinzinger and other dissenters leaving the party or just getting out of politics altogether? 
But remember, my stock and trade is the voters. So I, I focus mainly on the people and not just the people who represent the people or who would like to represent the people. I mean, the gift of my professional life has been to uh, literally go to all 50 states at least once to do projects, to literally sit in focus groups, to look over the data. And that's been such a gift because you end up having such a deep respect for and understanding of the people. And, and, and some of the best ideas I've ever heard and have applied politically have come from the voters. Uh, they have a lot to say and they, they have essential wisdom. They thought this through. So I think the realignment of the Republican Party right now, and this to me is going to be a realignment re election because we are going to do better among women and suburban women. We are going to do better among Hispanics. We are going to do better again among working class men and women, non-college educated men and women um, who have been very hurt in this economy and by energy dependence. So we are going to do better in places and spaces that are, will surprise folks. And I look at that more. But in terms of the America First Party, the answer is yes, but it's truly the party of the worker. And I like to say it's not just the party of the job creators, that's about 7% of the country, or the job seekers, let's just call it 7%. I understand what the unemployment rates are, I understand job reduction. Let's just say, for argument's sake, the vast majority of American households, and the vast majority of households in every single state that you cover, are neither job seekers nor job creators, they're job holders. And I think the realignment for the party, John, is which party speaks to all of those issues? What are you concerned about? How in the world did I read in the Washington Post two months ago mm -hmm. that one of the fastest growing new groups of homeless in our country are single moms who have a job? I could not believe what I'm reading. I just got goosebumps repeating it to you. How in the world can that be? That you're a single mom who has a job. You're doing the best you can and it's not enough. So people are saying, John, when in the world did the job not become enough? If your grandfather had a job or my grandfather had a job, it was enough to support the family. Yeah, maybe things were tight or tough, but you figured it out. And now people feel like it's, things are just not enough. So that's the alignment. As for Liz Cheney, who I've known for many years, Adam Kinzinger, they both, um, well, he retired. She lost her reelection. Um, I don't think they want to go down as being known for essentially one thing, um, especially in the case of Congresswoman Cheney, who I've known for a very long time. I took my kids out to Wyoming two summers in a row to help raise money for her. Um, I respect the public service of the Cheney family. Um, she is a bona fide expert, you know, female Republican expert on national security and foreign policy issues, but I don't hear much of that anymore. So, um, but I, I don't worry about this person or that person. My job is to listen to the people. And I have never heard the people so loud and so, and so of a single mind on what is bothering them going into these midterms. Gabby, sorry, John, can we keep going? Okay. And maybe, maybe later. Uh, Gabby Orr from CNN. Hey, Kellyanne, thank you for doing this, and thank you, Linda. Um, you've talked earlier about Republican candidate recruitment this cycle and how they've had success getting candidates who look more like Americans, who are younger, who are more diverse. Um, as we approach the midterms and shift our focus to 2024, do you think that it would be a mistake for the Republican Party to renominate Donald Trump in a presidential primary? Does that, is that a you know, step back in, in terms of candidate recruitment and putting fresh blood forward? No. Well, first of all, that's up to the voters completely, and it's up to the voters in the different states. So I never rob the voters of their choice and their voice. I think we've got an incredibly strong, solid bench moving forward, and I think the Democrats haven't built theirs, much to my surprise. I'm, I'm totally surprised that they haven't. I'm, I'm surprised they've allowed sclerosis to set in um, in some of these Senate races even, which should be safe. They should have been put away. When you've got Tiffy, Tiffany Smiley in Washington State keeping 30-year incumbent Patty Murray under 50% in all polling, including ours, it tells you something. When Maggie Hassan is, is arguing um, to keep her seat, you know, against a Balduck who we were told is the wrong person and Chuck Schumer helped to make him the nominee. Thank you so much. Um, first he gave ridiculous investments to the Lincoln Project and then he gave ridiculous investments to make sure some of these Republicans were the nominees um, and, and they seem to be holding their own. No, Donald Trump's theory of the case is not the age or the gender. It's that he already did this job and did it better than the current president. So if you have that binary choice starkly in front of you and you strip away everything else and you just say, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, energy under each, border under each, Putin under each, gas prices, baby formula, 
national security, physical security in our communities. But let's face it, things won't be stripped away. There will be a lot of you know, think, uh, issues and ideas flying out there in the ether. So, um, and then he'll have to decide who he wants as his vice presidential nominee if he becomes the nominee. But look, I think if Donald Trump announces, there will be some people who run against him. I'm fairly confident of that. But he has, he, I think Donald Trump has a better shot of being the Republican nominee for president than Joe Biden has of being the Democratic nominee for president. And that is just a remarkable, if not historic, uh, type of observation, in fact. Do you personally think he should run? I personally think he should do what he wants to do. And I understand that he wants to make right all the, all the um, issues that he made right while he was president. I mean, look, <clears throat> I think the reason people want to only talk about January 6th and only talk about the period of time between, I'll just say, November 3rd and January 20th, two years ago, is because they somehow want his legacy to not be real, even though many people, including around the table, I would imagine benefited from it economically. Um, people want back somebody who is willing to challenge the establishment who's willing to make tough decisions, who works with a volume and velocity that is breakneck. And sorry, I worked in a White House where all we heard all day was chaos and crisis, chaos and crisis, chaos in a tweet, a crisis in, in the situation room, an answer to, I mean, excuse me, crisis in the <clears throat> briefing room, an answer to a question where now we have, I mean, my goodness, you don't have a press secretary, you can do what I'm doing here. For those of you listening and not watching, no nets, no note, no binders here. No, no lies. And so now we have chaos and crisis everywhere we look. We have chaos at the border. We have crisis in our streets, on the shelves where baby formula should be, at the gas pump, in the grocery store, in the Middle East, in Ukraine. So again, and I always hear, and I hear this a lot from donors, what about so-and-so? What if we can have all the Trump accomplishments without Trump? Well, what if we could have the Trump agenda without Trump? Well. The Trump agenda, five of those 11 letters, A, G, E, N, D, A, five of the 10 letters of Trump agenda are Trump. So you could try, but I think many people will say, why would I take a chance on an heir to the Trump agenda when I can have the real thing? Are you thinking we'll about see. Ron DeSantis? I'm thinking about many people. And if I'm, if I'm Ron DeSantis, I'm going to have a monster reelection. He got elected with less than 50% of the vote. He only won by 32,000. With the help of President Trump, Brian Kemp won in Georgia with the help of President Trump. And I'm sure they're both very grateful and knowledgeable about that. Uh, but if I'm DeSantis, I do what statewide elected officials running as Republicans have not been able to do, which is I get into the mid-50s in my reelection. That would truly be remarkable and consequential, and he should get a ton of credit for that. Because Rick Scott won three statewide races with less than 50% of the vote. And I say this because if I'm Ron DeSantis, um, I, sure, I could think about running, but why not go be the best two-term governor of the third largest state in modern history, if not ever, and then walk into the presidency in 2028? And I say that because most of his generational peers who would consider running, most of them, are in the United States Senate. I know them all, I like them all, I honor each and every one of their public service, but let's face it, if you're in the United States Senate and you're running for president, what do you have to show for that versus the DeSantis record in Florida? Okay. Uh, David Jackson from USA Today. The environment is very good for Republicans, but, you know, the, the Senate is still a toss-up. And we've got Ohio, New Hampshire, Georgia, Arizona, and Pennsylvania. Those are all Trump candidates. And Republicans in those states tell me that the Trump factor is a drag, that these races should be pretty easy, but they're not. And, and the common denominator is, that, is the Trump factor. Why are they wrong? The common denominator is, should be the Democrats. Those, those races that you just mentioned, the entire, most of the theory of the case should be about the Democrats. I think Adam Laxalt's a good example of someone who did that. He made that race about his Democratic opponent who people in Nevada, we've polled there, they just can't tell you what she's done. They literally can't, you know, if you just ask them, what's the top accomplishment of Senator Catherine Cortez Masto? I don't know, or I have no idea is the number one response. It's very hard to get reelected 
in a good Republican year when you yourself as a United States Senator has not distinguished on your record enough. Um, I think the, the issue in Georgia, as hard as everybody tries to make it, should be Raphael Warnock not Herschel Walker. I think the issue in New Hampshire should be Maggie Hassan's record. She won by 1,017 votes, I'm not mistaken last time, three tenths of a percentage point. So she's got a big, she's got a big issue, thing to climb. And, and let me just say this about Trump candidates also, and I've said this to the president many, many times. They don't do what he did, many of them. People get really lazy. I'm thinking of a couple candidates in particular who have not put away their races yet. Maybe you even mentioned them. Maybe you mentioned the states. Uh, you have to do the work. You as reporters, me in my life, them as candidates, you have to do the work. You don't get Donald Trump's endorsement and fall asleep and stop campaigning and not go and do what he did, which is five stops a day, seven stops a day, eight stops a day. Connect with the voters. Give, give interviews to press, national-based press like you are, and then local press. I mean, I write in my book, Here's the Deal, one of the untold stories of our victory in 2016 <laughs> Is when before he before Donald Trump took to the debate the rally stage and the national press were there waiting for him, he was backstage giving interviews to local press, radio, TV, print, and those headlines were usually very just just the facts, ma'am. Donald Trump gave me an interview. Trump says economy is number one. Trump said he'll win Pennsylvania, and then that would live in the local press where everybody saw it for the better part of three, four, seven days. So those candidates also have to go run their own races. Donald Trump cannot put them on his back and go be the governor of this state or the senator of that state. And I feel very, very strongly about that. But let me say this too. Um, Donald Trump told me right before the Georgia races in 20, um, 2021, he happened to call me about an entirely different issue. And I was at the Savannah airport. I had long left the White House, but I was asked, by David Perdue if I could take his seat on Kelly Leffler's plane and campaign with Sonny Perdue for the last day because David and Bonnie Perdue were quarantined. Um, somebody, they had been exposed to COVID. And I went down and I campaigned. And I said right away, you know, I'm just off message here. <laughs> I said right away, no, no, you're great. I said, I'm just off message. Like, why, why are we talking about this and this? I'm saying Kelly Leffler is going to be the first elected female, you know, Republican senator in the history of Georgia. And uh, she voted 100% for Donald Trump's judges. and. Anyway, so the president calls me about an entirely different issue. He said, are you coming to Georgia with us tonight? I said, no, I just wrote a reporter on Twitter from Bloomberg said I'm coming to Georgia with, I'm actually at the Savannah airport going home. And he was asking me about something totally different. And he knows we didn't discuss election fraud. And he said, um, he said, what do you think? I said, Mr. President, you just need to come here in, to Dalton, Dalton, Georgia tonight and tell your folks to vote for Kelly and David. That's it. They would need to hear from you. He said, you know what? I'm going to do that. But, and he, yeah, I'm going to do that, honey. And yes, he calls me honey, and I've been called much worse, including by many of you. And um, he said, but when they win, I get none of the credit. When they lose, I get all the blame. And I've never really forgotten that, because that will happen again in these midterms. But I don't care how you slice it, he'll have a lot to brag about after these midterms. He could have just sat it out. He could have pulled an Obama and just shown up in the last couple of weeks, President Obama, last week or so. And honestly, as popular as President Obama is within the party, He's off message too. He gave a great statement to the podcast a couple of weeks ago where he said, I'm going to tell my party, stop talking about all these other things. You can go and pull the quotes. You got to talk about kitchen table issues, I believe was his quote. And he's right, but he didn't take his own advice. He's not taking his own advice. So um, again, different candidates, never Trumpers, people who don't have an in to Trump, people who honestly would never be hired by the private sector, this Republican consultancy of grifters and drifters who need each other for the gravy train, who need each other to be a walking RICO violation and what I call staff infection. They will always criticize to each of you. Um, but I would just say to them, try this. It's super hard to win a presidential race. It's super hard. Ask Trump's 2020 team that. Where are they? Um, and sorry. Well, those candidates, the candidates who are running, the, the nominees, that he endorsed, right. they think he's a drag. I want them to say it on the record to you. Yeah. I want it to be a headline yeah, to you. Just regular voters, but yeah. yeah. No, well, no, by no. the way, some of them are running against some really good Democratic candidates. So some of them are not. But I would just tell you, it's it's very different. They they have to you know they have to run their own races. Frankly, they have to connect. You have there's no substitute. You want to run for office? I don't recommend it. But guess what? You have to connect with the voters. You do. No one else can do it for you. Not your ad makers. Not ex presidents named Obama or Trump. You have to connect with the voters. Okay, Tom Lobianco from Yahoo. 
Hey, Glenn. Thank you so much. Um, you recall, of course, the many rumors about replace, potentially replacing by, then Vice, Vice President Mike Pence on the ticket to bring in a woman to run. At, you know, two, two, three years ago, it was Nikki Haley. Um, now we have that same dynamic where you hear uh, Marjorie Taylor uh, Greene's name floated routinely, among others. It gets to that core point, though, of how, why does Trump have so much trouble with independent women voters, and why would that change? And again, too, and you, and you don't need to tell you this, that this was the Javanka calculation going into 2020. Would actually adding a woman running mate change that at all in 24? Well, a few things. I just wrote an op-ed on FoxNews.com. You can pull it where I talk about all issues are women's issues. I, for 34 years of doing this, have never heard the term men's issues. Not a single time have you. Anybody here ever typed the words men's issues? Of course you haven't. Because the presumption is that men can handle all the issues. We can, you can do the economy and energy and Putin and, and is, is Israel. And you can do border security and crime. And you can throw in a little bit of education and health care if you need to. But that women are only you know, women's issues. So women care if you share their gender, but they really care if you share their position on issues and vision for the future. And if you hear them. So President... Trump, if he runs and he gets the nomination, if he runs, he will get the nomination, in my view, of course. Uh, he'll pick a, a vice presidential running mate. I've had these discussions with him that he's comfortable with, that he thinks complements his, his presidential run or his presidency and will not be interfering with getting back to a great economy and energy independence and the like. Um, whether that's a woman, whether that's a candidate of color, I mean, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I wouldn't put much stock into any one name or anyone, or anyone who's on the list or not the list who has a, a good PR team to get their name out there, but I think he's got a wide aperture of possibilities, there's no doubt. On independent women, though, we can't have it both ways, so let me sew up this conversation. If independent women, as the New York Times poll said, moved 34 points in a month from Democrat to Republican on the generic ballot, if the Wall Street Journal poll this week showed suburban women migrating over since August to now, over two months, by 26 <clears throat> points. That is Donald Trump's party. That you're saying, you're all saying, that's Donald Trump's party. They can't get it, and they, he can't get out of his own way. It's still Donald Trump, it's still Donald Trump. It's, can't have it both ways. Either he's the nominee of a party where those shifts are taking place during a midterm election between two of his presidential elections, where he has been still this larger than life figure, very involved in midterms, or he's not. So if you sew it all together, he will benefit from that. Look, I think independent women, first of all, we beat Hillary Clinton, the queen bee herself, who would have been, quote, the first female president of the United States and never will be. And women were a majority of the voter. I rest my case. In other words, there are ways we knew how to communicate with women. I think in 2020, they did a terrible job with women and terrible job. I'm very critical of the 2020 campaign in my book. They had $1.4 billion and we're running against Joe Biden. The same Joe Biden we see every day, just in the basement, but the same Joe Biden we see every day. $1.4 billion, thereby proving the old adage, the fastest way to make a small fortune is to have a very large one and waste most of it. But they did terrible among women and independent women, suburban women, for a couple of reasons, not least of which is the number one issue then was COVID. People were legitimately afraid about COVID and they needed a better response. Does that number of independent women, the plus 34 swing, does it increase or decrease with Trump actually on the ballot in 24? Uh, I think it, it, it'll stay the same. Um, it, it, let me say this, does it increase or decrease? It's not static, so let me amend my answer. I think he's got a great, I think the Republican nominee for president, including President Donald J. Trump, has as best a shot as ever uh, um, as a challenger campaign, which is what this would be. So let me, let me say that, as a challenger campaign because these presidential candidates always do better among women, normally do better among women the second time. Um, George W. Bush, Ronald Reagan certainly, with Geraldine Farrar on the other team's ticket, et cetera. But I, I also will say that the Kamala Harris factor is important here. Women are very negative about her right now. Her disapproval rating has been stuck where it is it's very hard to watch her battle that teleprompter and see the teleprompter win every single time. And people know what they see and what they hear. This is not racism and sexism that leads to her disapproval ratings. This is eyesight and hearing. And if she were, if there were, if there were, she was remotely competent and 
confident in her job, I'm telling you, they'd be able to say to Joe Biden, step aside because she can beat Donald Trump. And we can have two terms of the Biden-Harris. You know, she'll, she'll go and have two terms. We can have three terms of Biden-Harris, the way George Herbert Walker Bush had three terms of Reagan Bush, for example. We can have three terms of this, the way Hillary wanted the third term of Obama. So they can't do that. But I think it's, look, none of it is static. It's all issue-based. And let me say this. We in this country, we protest and pontificate in groups. We vote as individuals. And that one vote, one person enshrined in the Constitution, the principle enshrined there, that one vote happens very privately, ladies and gentlemen. You fill out your ballot and put it in the mail. You show up and close the screen or the little cloth drape. Your vote is very private. And I coined the term in 2016, undercover hidden Trump voter. They weren't embarrassed to say they were voting for Trump. They just didn't look like they should be. They're tired of every night feeling like Thanksgiving with the in-laws. Like, I just don't want to fight with people in my circle of life. I'm not allowed to say I'm voting for him. There will be so many of them in 2024, you won't, even know how to, you won't even know how to keep up with them. They weren't there in 2020 when I heard his campaign saying, we have a hidden undercover Trump voter. No, you don't. They're wearing their red MAGA hat standing in the snow waiting for him at a rally. They're having boat parades on the weekends. They weren't hidden. But they will be again. Okay, so it's it's ten o'clock. We started a little late. Can, oh, keep can going. you take a few more? Okay, I got four You're people. You're paying me by the word, right? right? I'm good. <laughs> uh, Danielle Kurtzleben of NPR. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to back way up because up top you mentioned broadly democracy being on the ballot a couple of times, both from the Republican and the Democratic point of view. But I want to ask about denying election results specifically, because to, to what degree do you see that? Uh, doing that as weakening democracy, whether it's via, you know, somewhere via knock-on factors causing violence or just people losing faith in the process. Doesn't that eventually at some point make it harder to govern? Election denying is a bipartisan problem. You have members, Democratic members of the House of Representatives as we sit, as we sit here, who have never, ever legitimized a Republican presidential election this century. This century. They voted against certifying the election in 2004, in 2000, well, in 2000, in 2004, in 2016. They shouldn't have done that. So, I would argue Stacey Abrams should not have said it. Hillary Clinton should not have said it. Uh, Nancy Pelosi certainly shouldn't have said it. And the press secretary should not have been tweeting at the time. Don't forget. Brian Kemp and the Republicans stole the election from Stacey Abrams and then referred to Donald Trump in a tweet in December of 2016 as the president elect. She referred to him as unprecedented. That is dangerous. And as a staffer, I'm just a staffer here, as a staffer who had Secret Service protection 24 7 at the beginning, you're damn right I worry about violence and threats. I have four children and my mother at home while well, that's happening. And yes, I'm very worried about that. And now, but I think, you know, when, when you talk about election deniers and you're only talking about 2020, you're losing a large swath of the country because they are looking at the Democrats now and saying, you are inflation deniers, you are crime deniers, you are recession deniers, you are lost learning and test score decline deniers, you are Putin and Ukraine deniers, you are a porous open border deniers. And that's a big problem for this party right now in this White House. I cannot believe, I'm happy he did, because it's so weird and it's so tone deaf, but Joe Biden picked another place that's three miles away from the White House last night to give a speech days before the midterm elections, while early voting is in earnest in many places. And he gave a speech about democracy on the ballot. It, it just, it makes no sense to me. He can do that, he's welcome to, but he is not acknowledging people's pain and their frustration. So when you say, if you say, I've seen this a, a, a lot now, um, so-and-so's an election denier and they're going to be secretary of state of the state or they're going to win governor of that state, how can that be? Don't forget all the things that people are looking at, including that. But I will tell you as a Republican, I was very worried, very worried that what happened in Georgia in 2021 with the two special elections was going to happen almost everywhere or could have happened anywhere in the primaries in 2022, meaning Republicans will say, forget it. It's not fair. My vote doesn't count. You're going to steal it again. I'm not going to vote. Instead, we had record turnout 
in these primaries in so many places, and much higher than Democrat. So that enthusiasm for voting a Republican Senate or Congress, and in some places governors, overtook people saying, I think it'll never be fair again. Uh, I'm very concerned though. Look, I gotta tell you, if something's that important to us, an election should be that important to us, graduation day, wedding day, election day, what happened to election day? It's like election trimester. We do it two months before election day, and we're counting the ballots three weeks after. That just can't be. I mean, that just can't be. People are reporting, you know, very deplorable conditions um, in these in these voting precincts where you want people to volunteer. I've got my two 18-year-olds about to cancel each other's vote out on Claudia and George, first-time voters in Bergen County, and um, they. We want young people to say, "Let me get in there." But again, if you only see a candidate through one prism, you're not seeing that candidate the way the voters see that candidate. I want to start with that. You're not, whether it's Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Carrie Lake, uh, John Fetterman. I'll give you two, two, from, two from either party. If you see Carrie Lake, you say election denier, you don't see the woman who articulates policies on the issues that people are starving to hear while her opponent can't tell you what she's going, how she's going to help one third of the electorate. Is you know sounds like the Taco Bell dog, frankly, when she responds to a very simple question about what would you do for Latinos and Latinas in the state. Um, I tell people all the time, and let me make very clear here: Republicans have to earn the win, and Democrats have to be made to eat and own all the policy failings and flailings of the Biden-Harris White House. If you spend all day as a Republican ridiculing Joe Biden's very obvious physical and mental challenges and you spend all day only talking about John Fetterman's stroke, you risk losing. The art of politics is not to tell people what they can see but what they can't see. And I think this drum, beat the drum, beat the drum, beat the drum about who's an election denier, their election deniers, election deniers, you're not telling, people already see that. They'll already have that as part of the calculus. The job is to tell them what they can't see, what they've either forgotten about and need to visualize or what they never knew in the first place. Okay, Hugo Lowell from The Guardian. Uh, I just want to bring it back to 24. If Trump uh, runs in 24, who do you think are kind of essential people for the campaign? Like, you know, Tony Fabrizio, like Crystal Savita, Taylor, I mean, those kinds of people? Or... Who was the third one? Like Taylor Budowich. <clears throat> uh, yeah, no, I've seen all their um, names in your stories. So we'll let them continue to talk to you about them and each other. Uh, so the, the president has, he talks to many different people. He <clears throat> never truly reveals mm -hmm. what he thinks about some people, which I think is very smart of him. Um, and I think, it, you know, the Bible says multitude of wisdom through a mul multitude of counselors. And I think that's very smart for any person in public office or who seeks public office. And that is very true of President Trump. Um, Though the three people you just mentioned, um, I'm sure would have some kind of role. And uh, remember, if you run for president, there's a lot of money attached to it. I think you saw that in 2020. That's why you don't hear from some of his core team from 2020, because they're somewhere counting their money. And he's at Mar-a-Lago and Bedminster, which are really nice places, by the way, but they're not the Oval Office. And so th that'll be true, and I think there will be um, He'll, he'll continue to talk to the people who he trusts who don't need, feel the need to get their name in the paper. And he will, um, he'll also continue to consult with folks who will not have formal roles in a campaign, but who are his larger kitchen cabinet, which has been very helpful to him as well. Uh, look, I wouldn't have had that job, the first job, the campaign manager, let alone senior counsel, let alone stayed there that long, if I weren't listened to and respected by my boss. and. That is, a, that is a situation that I think a number of people have with Donald Trump. I think that the reason I do talk to him regularly and the reason that we have a good relationship, even though we disagree fundamentally on certain things, is because we disagree fundamentally on certain things. And he likes people who deliver news, good, bad, or ugly, respectfully, and in my case, deferentially, since he was President of the United States, the same way I would treat President Obama or President um, Biden if they were here. I believe in respecting the office of the presidency. I think that ought to be catching, by the way. And, um, but he likes people who aren't obsequious. I think one of the dumbest things ever said about him, 
and it was said is he only wants yes men around him. He wants people who are obsequious. No, he doesn't, because then he doesn't know where he stands. Then he doesn't. Then you're afraid to tell him an article that one of you just reported that he needs to know, or he doesn't see the pitfalls and the pratfalls of how COVID's not going to go away as an issue. It's not going to go away as a virus, it's not going to go away as an issue. People are very worried about it for any numbers. Women are the chief health care officers. They, we control two every health care dollar spent. They were very worried about COVID and they were voting according to that way. So, yes, but I think he'll have a team that's familiar to you. And I think he'll have a team of, of new players as well. But also, don't forget, sure, there are some people who believe in the America First agenda, but don't forget, it's a lot of money to be made in some of these presidential campaigns. I lost money in 2016 because I was Pence's pollster for his governor re-election and we moved him over. Um, and you know, I had to give up all my clients to stay. This isn't about me, but this is also about you always have true believers and you always have people who, as you've seen, because you see the backgrounds of the really nice places on Room Raider when they're doing these things. You have people who, Republican consultants, who failed to ever help elect somebody president, who consultants, the candidates often lose, the consultants always win. So he'll be watching that too. Would you work on the Trump campaign? I'm sorry. Just to that point, if you are asked to run the 24 campaign, would you accept? I, I'll, let, I'll let President Trump make his decisions on personnel. I certainly am with a majority of this country, a majority of Democrats in this country. I don't want Joe Biden in 2024 either. Uh, Todd Gilman from the Dallas Morning News. So I have a different 2024 question. I've been taking notes, I'm sure we all have. Um, you've said today Trump is already running for president. Uh, but he's just been waiting to No, no, announce. I didn't say that. I said he's never stopped campaigning, never stopped. Okay. including for other people. Okay. There's a big difference. And you, you said he would definitely win the nomination if he runs. Um, but there are a couple of dozen other Republicans who are either already running or are thinking about running. So since we're short on time, could you handicap maybe the top 15 of them? <laughs> sure. Who, 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 sure. Who among them is the biggest has- threat to deprive him of the nomination? Well the biggest threat to deprive him of the presidency of winning is different so you can have a spoiler come in the way Ross Perot did in 1992 Ross Perot's best state was Maine as I recall he got 30 percent of the vote worst state Mississippi nine percent but he didn't get electoral votes he had 19 percent of the national vote and it was enough to give way to the Bill Clinton presidency Bill Clinton won with less than 50 percent of the vote he did much better the second time but so you can have a spoiler that can't take the nomination away from you the way Pat Buchanan couldn't get the nomination away from George Herbert Walker Bush that time, but paves the way for this strong enough third party candidate. And then the president, the new president, whoever it is, if it's Biden, Trump, somebody we're not thinking about on the Democrat, they get elected with far less than 50 percent of the vote. That's the more likely scenario to me than somebody denying him the nomination. I think, look, in some ways it happened to um, Jimmy Carter also. So Ted Kennedy challenges him for the nomination, and Ted Kennedy wins 12 states, 12 primaries, including California and New York. Carter wins more of them, stays as the nominee, but he's so, you know, bloodied up, I think, um, against Reagan that it's hard for him to prevail. So that, for me, is the more likely scenario, and I've, I've raised that with the people who need to hear it. Um, and so, and again, I, you know, say, oh, you know, Kellyanne thinks this candidate, that candidate has a chance to be the spoiler. Well, of course they do. And I also think it'll be not just some of the folks, the Never Trumpers who want to run. And it's very, again, it's very lucrative also to be a Never Trump, run, Never Trumper running. There are cable contracts to be had. There are books to be written. There is all the hype and glory that you never would have had otherwise because you never had it otherwise. So all you have to do is see that to know. But um, that's the part that, you know, I can see Biden or Trump easily less than 50 percent. It's getting over 50 percent and getting the electoral vote that really matters. And then I think you'll be surprised. There will be a couple of Republicans who kind of try to suss it out, see if Trump's really as vulnerable as they hear, as they think out on the campaign trail. And then the rest is up to President Trump. Is he out there spending most of his time talking about what people miss most about him, which is a resolute decision maker who challenges the establishment and gets stuff done? That economy, particularly before COVID, is indisputably a great economy that people miss. Energy, and I got to tell you, um, I, I traffic in data, obviously. That's what I do for a living. I have my own company again in the last two years. But let me tell you, 
um, when you listen to people in focus groups, you'd be shocked who's willing to vote for him. Uh, it would shock you because it doesn't comport with maybe what you think. A lot of crossover Biden voters who voted for him because he wasn't Trump. So he doesn't really have a governing constituency, seems to me. I don't know what the Trump, what the Biden constituency is. I'm not being sarcastic. I don't know what it is. And if you win because you're not the other guy, you don't do enough to have this governing majority. You don't do enough to have the issue set that people, that people associate back with you. It's hard then to run. Um, I think it'd be harder to run. In some ways, I think the, the criticism of Trump, the lawsuit, everything that's happened, the, the obsession with Trump, I mean, it's very odd. I'm as close to him as any you know, family member, my goodness. And I, I, I'm so grateful to him for giving me a great job and for improving many things about this country. But I cannot possibly obsess over him the way some other people who say they don't like him do. It's kind of weird. And I think Trump derangement syndrome is real. Mm -hmm. I think there is no vaccination or booster for it. And it sort of distorts. It distorts people thinking that everybody in the electorate sees him the way they do. People are hurting in this country, ladies and gentlemen. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. I'm going to say again, one of the fastest growing new groups of homeless are single moms who don't have a job. People are hurting. Okay. And they need relief. Okay. One really tiny last question, then we got to run. Juliana from Der Tagesspiegel. Thank you for uh, doing this. Um, you said, uh, Kevin McCarthy, you expect him to have a governing majority after the midterms. What would that mean for America's foreign policy, especially when it comes to Ukraine, for example? What do you expect? <clears throat> I, I personally don't think you'll see much of a change, uh, meaning this country will continue to support Ukrainian people, continue to do what we can to help there, and continue to be unequivocally resolute against the unprovoked invasion of a sovereign nation on um, first time in decades, obviously, by a very dangerous man who seems um, to want to continue to cause a lot of pain and destruction, mm. and not just in Ukraine. Uh, I think the question also has to go to the Senate and what they'll do. The margins will be tighter there. but. Um, there's another issue. I just, I, I don't really know that it's been articulated sufficiently by this administration and by that podium. Um, what we're doing and not doing and why and why not. What this country feels it can do and is doing and what it feels it shouldn't do and can't do. Um, and there's that too. And let me just also say about January 6th, uh, gosh, I, I hope people know a lot more about that day than I do. Um, I was hoping that we would learn more about what the FBI knows or what the intelligence community knows or I, I really doesn't really matter to me as much you know what young people I work with at the White House think they knew about that day it matters a whole hell of a lot to me with the people in charge of knowing what happened that day and knowing what might have happened that day long in advance know what happened that day. So that also is an important threat to democracy. If you're going to make superstars out of people you didn't really know or didn't care much about when, um, when they were very difficult to deal with as Trump's sycophants in the White House, then we're really missing an important conversation, which is, what did law enforcement know? What did the FBI know? And, and, and should we know that again? Should we know that again? And you're worried about violence, and not, I definitely am, but I'm worried about it everywhere. I'm, I'm worried about violence and criminals everywhere. It's, in, it's an indiscriminate fear and concern in this country right now, I can promise you that. Mm -hmm. So it needs to have an indiscriminate type of coverage and resolution as well. All right. Well, thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Thank you for staying over time. No, no, it's no, no. Try it, Kamala. Come on, come down here. You can do this. <laughs> All right. Hillary, you can do this. President Trump, putting on your Trump advisor hat for a moment, do you think that he should testify? I don't think he should, no. Have you told him that? Yes. Okay. I happened to be with him the day he, they said they were going to subpoena him. Mm -hmm. I happened for other, another reason. Um, no, I don't. I think he should cooperate however, it, however it's best for him to cooperate, and I believe he, he has. Um, no, I think they should have done their work a whole year mm -hmm. earlier. And without all this fanfare and celebrity and um, so I, I, I think many things about that, but uh, it's not Kellyanne Conway saying, oh, Donald Trump should defy the subpoena and not cooperate. Um, you know, 
many of you covered the Mar-a-Lago raid with such relish because it looked like it was a faster way to get Donald Trump than the January 6th committee finishing its work. So there too, I, are we waiting for a report? Are we, is this a political exercise so that he never runs again? Because it's not your typical congressional hearing where both parties have seats at the table, real seats at the table, not placeholder seats, um, and where you can ask questions. It's not a legal proceeding that anybody is familiar with where you have cross-examination, where, where witnesses, albeit under oath, cannot say without objection. I think the gist of what I was hearing, if I recall correctly, might have been X. You can't do that in a court of law. That doesn't stand. And so I think that's why the January 6th committee's work, or January 6th itself, is lower in the polls than maybe some people would have expected or wanted. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he hasn't, other people have made their decisions. I don't know why some people did what they did in complying with the committee and others didn't. Uh, I think people should try to be helpful to democracy however they can. But I also think that this is what America sees is this relentless pattern of not trying to get the story of trying to get Donald Trump. And for better or for worse, they see the Mar-a-Lago raid, they see the January 6th committee, they see Tish James, they see trials, they see Russia collusion, they see two impeachments, they see many, many different people, places, and things in the service of trying to get Donald Trump. And it's very hard for them to focus and say, this is the one most important. Um, I think they ran out of time for him to properly comply with a, with a subpoena. They're, they're going to run out of time. They could have done it a year ago, but they didn't. So, so 24 hours for him to still say yes or no, you don't expect him to? I will not, I will not say what he's going to do one way or the other. Um, I'm just saying that if, look, this is the deal. I'm a fully recovered attorney, paid way too much for my law degree. Let me leave it. Let me use it for a second. When you are, when you are, quote, prosecuting a case, so you're amassing evidence, or you want a grand jury to indict someone, you don't end with the most important testimony. You begin with it. So the question remains for the committee, why didn't you start with him? Hmm. Oh, he would have done it. No, you don't get to say that. You've had an entire year and a half to tell us what's important to us with nobody objecting, with some witnesses being coached in front of our eyes, and so on and so forth. Start with him. Was this some kind of crescendo? Was this some, some kind of we'll save the best for last and then we'll... So they, they could have done that, but they didn't. And now I think they're going to run out of time. I'll tell you, that's not how investigation works. You go for a target at the end of the investigation. You don't go for a target on the investigation at the start of it. Sometimes. But what has been the, what has been the most common name or five-letter word said in, these, in, in the January 6th hearings? Trump. Or in your coverage of it, Trump. So it's not as if it's a big surprise where this is headed or why we're even here in the first place. And what's happening also is people are watching as the January 6th Rioters, people who committed crimes, are being prosecuted and punished for those crimes. They see that. They see that. And so, I don't know. I, I have to disagree with you on this one only because I understand the way investigations work. But on this one, if he's been the central figure, and this has been the raising dancer from the beginning, for the committee. I mean, they're not in charge of prosecuting somebody who came from Texas and Florida and New Jersey who's now in, in going to prison or who's, who's been confined the whole time. Uh, they're in charge of this. The whole point here from the beginning, go back and look at the opening statements. Go back and look at what, what, what the purpose of, it, of inviting people to testify who couldn't possibly know what was going on that day completely. There's no way they can. How could they? You don't. I don't. But I, I surely hope Christopher Ray does. That's my whole point. Like, I sure hope he does. And I'm waiting for him to tell us. I'd love to hear it so that we can avoid it in the future, whatever the it is. I want to hear it about the riots in 2020. I want to hear it about January 6th. I want to know. Because, of course, safety is important. So I don't know why they waited so long to mm. subpoena him. So, John, did you want to throw in another little tiny Sure, question? we're having so much fun. I know, and then we really got to go. Right. <laughs> uh, after the elections, a few weeks after the elections, the Republican National Committee will have its winter meeting. Uh, do you believe Ronna McDaniel will, should run and be elected to an unprecedented fourth term as chairman? I believe she should run and she will run and she will win. Okay. She is respected among the 168 members who make that choice. 
Uh, I think she's an unsung hero of the last several years, particularly these midterms. She, um, the RNC has made sure that they have stood up these community centers in so many places in this country. The first one, I believe, was in Orange County last year where Congresswoman Young Kim and Michelle Steele, first two Korean-American uh, members of female, yeah, Republican women, have um, where they are. But they've put, them every, they've put them in so many different places, and it's been a great resource for people to just walk in and say, what is this about? What really is a Republican? What do you stand for? How are the parties different? They filed lawsuits when they needed to. They've said, let's make it. Um, easier to vote, harder to cheat. She's great on TV. I don't know where Jamie Harrison is. Somebody should really tell him, why don't you get out there and push for your party the way Rana does. The messaging, I think that I think they put out the best rapid response of anyone anywhere. And to the earlier questions about who will be on the campaign, uh, I think what the RNC has been able to do by keeping the president probably their best fundraiser, I would think, um, in their direct mail, on the stump. I, I've been there when he has showed up at different RNC events, as has Vice President Pence and Secretary Pompeo and others. Uh, I think they've done a great job of keeping the issue agenda intact, but being a partisan organization, it is their job to elect Republicans. But they've also done a pretty good job of holding Biden and Harris and the Democrats, Pelosi, Schumer and the rest, they've been holding them accountable. They come up with things these folks have said, like election denying. Nancy Pelosi was election denier. Hillary Clinton certainly. Stacey Abrams. They do a really great job. I think it's an enormous sacrifice for any chairman, chairwoman. Um, she has teenage kids. She has a college a daughter. She has a, a, a senior in high school like I, I have too. And it's a huge sacrifice, but they want her to stay. And she's done a great job. And I think if she were listened to more in 2020, he would have had a different outcome. All right, all right. Thank you all for coming and staying, um, and I hope you'll come again. And as Donald Trump would say, let's see what happens. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Today on C-SPAN, a discussion on monetary policy and global inflation a day 